Ghanaian cuisine is flavorful, spicy, and oily, in part because so much of it contains rich red palm oil, a staple of Central and Western Africa for thousands of years, during which people here have been cultivating the oil palm trees, harvesting the oil itself for food and soap, tapping the trunks for palm wine that they distill into medicinal alcohol, and of course, burning the biomass for green power. Over the past half century, the rest of the world has discovered palm oil too. And today, it's a $60 billion per year market that provides material for everything from fuels to food to face paint. But that money isn't flowing into Western and Central Africa. Instead, it's flowing into Indonesia and Malaysia, thanks to Dutch and British traders who brought African palm there in the 19th century just as a Ghanaian agronomist named Tate Karshi was bringing cacao trees from the Amazon forest to Ghana. As a result of this inadvertent crop swap, 66% of the world's cocoa now comes from Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire, while Southeast Asia produces 80% of the world's palm oil, and the Amazon region produces massive amounts of soy and beef. These lucrative cash crops have brought economic wealth to some, economic ruin to others, and environmental degradation to most. Oil palm, for example, claimed more than 10 million hectares of Indonesian forest, much of it on ancient peat bogs in just the past 30 years. That decimated traditional societies, nearly eliminated rare species like the orangutan, and accelerated climate change by unleashing billions of tons of greenhouse gas as the carbon of the trees mixed with oxygen in the air to form carbon dioxide, and the peat bogs, essentially thousands of years of soggy leaves, trees, limbs, and decaying animals were suddenly exposed to the air, releasing methane, a greenhouse gas that traps 80 times as much heat as carbon dioxide does. As a result, Indonesia consistently ranks as the world's fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases, and sometimes third, behind only the United States and China. Here in Africa, Côte d'Ivoire has lost 80% of its forest in roughly the same period to cacao. Now, Indonesian and Malaysian palm oil companies are expanding into Africa, and many environmental NGOs say this could kill off those few forests that haven't already been cleared to make way for cacao. Surprisingly, lots of palm oil producers also recognize the threat, and many of those who are active here belong to something called the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil, or RSPO, which sets global standards for sustainable palm oil production. Today's guest, Samuel Avala, says Africa can embrace palm oil without destroying forests because, he says, the problems lie in the processes used to grow it and not in the plants themselves. He runs Benzo Oil Palm Plantations, or BOPP, BOP, which is one of Ghana's oldest and largest commercial palm oil producers. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, and we know it's ugly face. We should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that drop the subsidies. Earth. We broke it, we own it. And nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields. And not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? Technology? Geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet, or is nature itself the answer? That's the question I address in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And today we examine one of those wicked problems that offers no easy solution, namely how to meet the world's ravenous appetite for palm oil in ways that lift poor farmers out of poverty without destroying and maybe even restoring our remaining forests. The obvious answer is to simply reduce our appetite But Ghanaian palm oil executive Samuel Avala says the key lies in helping small, independent producers increase their productivity. 
He's also one of a growing number of executives arguing for nationwide, regionwide, and even global environmental standards. And he says government regulation is not a dirty word any more than palm oil is, provided that regulation is implemented in a fair, transparent, and science-based way. When Avala joined BOP in 1991, the company belonged to Unilever, which is a Dutch company that even then had a reputation for being good on the environment. In 2010, BOP was purchased by a Singapore-based company called Wilmar International, which did not have that stellar reputation and which had used connections and corruption to build up its palm oil empire, destroying millions of hectares of forest in the process. But in the mid-2000s, in response to demand from exporters and pressure from NGOs like Greenpeace, Wilmar had begun to change its tune. It also joined RSPO and pledged to turn itself around by purging deforestation from its palm oil supply chain. Did the company keep its word? We'll find out in a bit because I caught up to Avala at the annual meeting of the Tropical Forest Alliance, or TFA 2020, in Accra, Ghana, where we sat down in a little meeting room, so it's a bit echoey, and you'll hear some clanks and thumps as workers move stuff around, but I think we get into some fascinating and important issues. You joined Unilever in 1991, and then you were working in BOP, which is the plantation that they, they had here. Unilever then joins the, the RSPO 2004, right? They were a founding They're member. They were founded members. The company joins RSPO, but then they, have, they certify each plantation individually. Did they have to make changes first, or was it already run in such a way that it qualified? Very sincerely, um, the, the Unilever Sustainable Agriculture, the, the principles and guidelines in that uh, program, when you put them side by side with RSVOP and C, you can see in most cases the practices were there and it had almost become a culture. What was lacking and needed to be filled up had to do with documentation. As you know, auditors will say, do you do so and so? You say, yes. Is there any evidence? And, and we had to go back and write and document and keep records that are up to date. That probably was the biggest uh, step we had to take. Otherwise, most of the things were part of our standard operating procedures. And okay. Like that, yeah. With BOP, you have a nucleus plantation and yes. then you have the smallholders. Small and that was always the case even before? Yes, okay. yes, yes. This term, nucleus plantation, is actually an Indonesian term. So I'm using it wrong here because in Africa, the term is outgrower. It comes from an Indonesian law requiring larger companies that get concessions to turn a portion of their concession over to smallholders. The company-run portion of the estate is termed the nucleus, and the smallholder-run portions are called plasma gardens, a reference to the plasma membrane that surrounds the nucleus of a cell. In Africa, something similar, not exactly the same, but similar is happening, especially in Liberia which has more standing forests to lose than most West African countries do, ironically because 15 years of civil war, which ended in 2003, prevented development. As I mentioned, in Africa, the term is outgrower. Like the plasma farmers of Indonesia, the outgrowers of Africa do have some sort of contractual obligation to the plantation, but BOP and other companies hope to increase the amount of palm oil they process by helping not just outgrowers, but independent smallholders who have no obligation to the company intensify their yields and prevent further expansion into the forest. By the way, if you want to help me increase production of these podcasts, you can give me a good five-star review on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, or wherever you access me. That's important because the more reviews I get, the more ears I get. And the more ears I get, the more minds I can reach. And only by reaching hundreds of millions of minds, literally, will we fix this mess. We can do it if we all work together. Finally, if you really like what you hear, 
these shows are mostly listener supported. Today's show is a byproduct of an article I wrote for Ecosystem Marketplace, so you can thank my employer, Forest Trends, for its existence. But the most successful shows are the ones that I create explicitly for the podcast audience, with multiple voices and story structure. For those, I need to put in time. And time costs money if I want to eat and pay my bills. The Environmental Defense Fund has stepped up with funding for some of these shows. But you can support me as well by becoming a patron at bionic-planet.com. You can help keep me afloat for as little as $1 per episode, either via bionic-planet.com or via patreon.com forward slash bionicplanet. So... One of the things we have aimed to do, and which we are doing, is to promote intensification. That is to say, um, get the highest yields possible from the same piece of land, and also bring along our smallholders in the same trajectory. Now, with that, the need for further expansion is reduced. And so we actually got certified together with our smallholder scheme, which is 1,650 hectares Mm -hmm. made up of uh, 438 farmers, of which a little above 25% are women. Very important to mention women because in the African context and in the family setting, they play very significant roles if we have to get their families get their daily bread and also respect the environment and Mm -hmm. social issues, then you cannot leave the women out. So we have taken this intensification commitment or objective further uh, by participating in a program that has been anchored by Solidaridad West Africa. They have a project they call Sustainable West Africa palm oil project, SWAP. They've been working with about nine or so sites, including our site, to try and implement what would become, if you like, the best management practice for oil palm cultivation in Africa. And the lead agronomist for this project has been Dr. Thomas Fairhurst, a a renowned uh, oil palm agronomist, and in collaboration with IPNI, What's IPNI? IPNI is uh, International Plant Nutrition Institute. And we have worked for four years, and the results look interesting. Mm -hmm. They look interesting because you can see that between a farm that is under the best management practice project and its reference, you can see the same size of land, the yield in the best management practice uh, farm, showing higher output without necessarily increasing the cost. Mm -hmm. Except that the initial inputs can be a little bit costly, and that's where the smallholders tend to have the problem. Um, How to get over that uh, hump and turn the corner. And that is where when the smallholders are associated with big plantations like us, we tend to carry them along. Right, right. So it's always uh, very necessary that we, as big plantations, also have our smallholders or outgrowers around us, and we carry them along so that in the end it's a win-win, mm-hmm. especially also demonstrating our commitment to you no know, deforestation, not being limited to ourselves alone, but also all those um, who are either our suppliers of raw material or our community people, as the case may be. What's entailed when you talk about intensification, especially with the smallholders? My understanding is that the beginning phase is so complicated that the nucleus plantations actually usually go in and do the replanting, and it's almost like a turnkey operation, right? They go in and... In in this specific case of ours, um, the smallholder plantation had already been planted, and it was planted under our supervision. The planting material was guaranteed of being the same quality and standard as our own. The planting standards and everything was just the same as ours. Mm -hmm. 
it had to do with the maintenance and even that one it was almost the same as our standard but under the bmp standard there were a few differences so which one's bnp I didn't the best management practice ah, okay in Sorry. fact <laughs> the intensification was anchored on developing a best management practice okay in collaboration with other sites under the swap project and, and so on This issue of best management practices is critical. We're in this climate mess in part because a critical mass of us bought into the fantasy that individual companies and businesses acting in their own benevolent self-interest can turn this mess around. At the TFA 2020 meeting where I met Samuel Avala, a surprising number of corporate leaders, some of whom had earlier been leery of regulation, we're actually calling not just for best management principles, but for higher standards of regulation. Why? Because the companies that have invested in doing things right are spending more, but they're not getting a premium in the market. There is, it turns out, something to be said for regulatory certainty. You could cynically argue that the only reason these companies are pushing for better environmental regulations is to avoid being undercut by sleazy companies doing things on the cheap. But we all need to make a living, myself included. And if some of us spend our own time and resources creating value rather than just extracting it, we should be compensated. And if you think I'm creating value by producing these podcasts, you can help me by becoming a patron at bionic-planet.com. You can help keep me afloat for as little as $1 per episode, either via bionic-planet.com or via patreon.com forward slash bionicplanet. You can support me per episode, but with a monthly cap. So if I do a flurry of shows in one month, you won't get whacked. Getting back to our interview, I had asked Avala to describe the activities that can increase production, and he listed a lot of them. But the most important one surprised me. But more importantly, maintaining a cycle day of harvesting or harvesting round of seven days. Uh huh. Why does that? Why is that so important? It's important because if you maintain that every seven days. This palm must be visited, and if there is a, a rye bunch, it should be harvested every seven days. No matter what, even if the plant is down, that seventh day you must go and harvest. Okay. What you gain from that is that the tendency of bunches getting overripe and rotting is reduced, and the tendency of the bunch, because of overripeness, shedding so much loose fruits that collecting becomes a very arduous task, in which case losses increase, you know. So that discipline keeps the losses to the barest minimum. Mm -hmm. Right, gotcha. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. The other one has to do with a certain nutrient management regime. Nutrient management regime simply means better managing the fertilizers you use. It turns out that if a farmer uses too much nitrogen, for example, it not only burns the plant, but mixes with oxygen to form nitrous oxide, a powerful greenhouse gas. Using sensors on satellite and drones, farmers can now manage their fertilizers in ways that not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also improve yields. This, by the way, is one of 20 natural climate solutions that can get us 37% of the way to meeting the Paris Agreement's two-degree target, according to research published last year in the Proceedings of the National Academies of the Sciences. If you want to learn more about that, check out episode 31 of Bionic Planet, where I interviewed report author Bronson Griscom of The Nature Conservancy. I also hope to catch up to Griscom next week at year-end climate talks in Katowice, Poland. Time and again in my travels across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, I've seen what a little bit of management can do in yields, whether it's agroforestry, which involves planting trees and among crops to infuse nutrients into the soil, or just trimming leaves. And more and more, thanks to efforts like SWAP, we're seeing what actually works, what doesn't, and how to support the former while abandoning the latter. Between reference and 
and the BMP side by side, same size unit area, you are getting 10, 15 or even more percent increase wow. in yield and, and it has, the yield profile has moved in two phases. The first phase is what we call um, the yield ticking. Yield ticking is at the very go of um, the BMP or best management practice uh, program. Um, there is a lot of recovery because of the past under recoveries there is a big opportunity to make a lot of quick gains. Right, right, right. So that's called the yield taking phase. Okay. Then after that one, you go into a second phase, which is called the yield making. Okay. The yield making takes rather a longer time, and yet that is even the more sustainable one because the practices are consistent, there's a discipline. Then the yield response taking a gradual but certain approach. When do these standards, when do these uh, best management standards, when do they come out? So Daridad has actually published the standards and that is what we believe that for us in Ghana and West Africa um, uh, smallholders and our growers constitute 70% um, of our production mm -hmm. and yet they are the most unproductive. Yeah. Their yields are sometimes a third of the side, the potential. Yeah. So with best management practices, even with existing farms, um, we believe that um, we can move our country from being a net importer of palm oil to a net exporter. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be done with very little or no further right, clearing right. of land right. which then yeah. puts forests uh, mm -hmm. at risk and gotcha. under pressure. Okay. And it's also so interesting that this is the birthplace of palm oil. It is. But it's it's mostly made in Indonesia and this and when I think of Ghana, I think of chocolate. <laughs> but which is not from here either. That's from uh, Latin America. So we're we're all living in this crazy kind of swapped out world. Um, and, and so now, now the, so you've got the, these smallholders, so you've got your own nuclear plantation and your smallholders, and now you're working with independent smallholders beyond. Yes, we, we have um, a department that is also engaging with the independent smallholders, mm -hmm. and some of them, depending on their credibility and, and seriousness, we support them with expertise and advice and and in return, they also sell their crop to us. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win kind of situation. But there's still the vast majority of outgrowers who are around and with whom we have no um, such agreements. But that is where the landscape approach or the jurisdictional approach to sustainability is, is actually a welcome idea. You'll hear these sustainability guys talk a lot about the landscape approach and the jurisdictional approach, as opposed to the project approach or the plantation approach. That's because certifying individual plantations and projects is expensive and inefficient. What's more, research by the Supply Chain Commodity Tracking Initiative shows that companies work better in cooperation with others, meaning that if they make a pledge to reduce deforestation, and then join a multilateral organization like TFA 2020, they're more likely to at least report on the progress they make towards delivering on their promises. It's kind of like joining a group class at a health club. Here's an example of how that works. Members of TFA 2020 first identified palm oil as a threat to West African forests in 2013. In response, the Alliance created something called the Africa Palm Oil Initiative, or APOI, to promote common principles of sustainability among governments and palm oil producers across the region, drawing on input from national steering committees. Avala joined the Ghanaian Steering Committee of APOI, and in 2016, Ghana became one of seven countries whose government signed something called the Marrakesh Declaration for the Sustainable Development of the Oil Palm Sector in Africa. They generally just call it the Marrakesh Declaration. It was signed at year-end climate talks in Marrakesh, Morocco, and it committed them to 39 principles, from enforcing fair labor laws to increasing transparency. Countries signed the Marrakesh Declaration for both moral and strategic reasons, 
morally to end deforestation and strategically to attract global buyers interested in sourcing deforestation-free palm oil. They spent much of 2017 forging standardized procedures, despite sharp differences in language, landscape, and legal tradition. I think that um, the, the jurisdictional approach, which makes the government at the government level, the national government level, and also the local government level and the traditional level, that will make it even easier for companies uh, that have specific um, 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 commitments to even make a wider impact. For them, mm. the space has been created and, right, right. and, and it's easy to operate with it. Gotcha, gotcha. W- when did you first start to get involved with TFA 2020? TFA 2020, I think that must have been in 2015 or thereabouts. Do you remember how the engagement began or how you first heard of it or what, you know, when... Was it because Wilma? Okay, already Wilma has a certain collaboration with TFA. I think they are a member of the TFA partners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so um, when TFA was starting its country level engagements in Ghana uh, with Pro Forest uh, leading, um, Wilma. In Ghana, like in everywhere else, is a is a key player that you cannot ignore, mm-hmm. and so we, we were invited eh, uh, to to participate in the in the engagements, okay. um, and I have always done the participation wearing two hats, one from Wilma, and and you can see that in this particular conference I'm mm-hmm. here on the ticket of Wilma, but also. Uh, as a, a president representing the oil palm association, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have always um, won the two cups like that. Do you feel that participating in the TFA meetings has that moved things forward? Has it had a has, has it had a measurable impact that we can point to? For measurable impact, I would say that thankfully, with the adoption of the Marrakesh Declaration, which is the high-level principles, it is moving the thing from just companies doing what they believe and what they are committed to, to the entire jurisdiction and making it a national issue. So for me, that is one measurable output. Mm -hmm. The next stage will be and is the implementation phase, Mm -hmm. the enforcement. Mm -hmm. At the moment, those principles, high-level principles, have not been made law. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, a study was done in Ghana looking at um, the laws of Ghana, the existing laws, to see whether some of those principles are already grounded in existing laws, uh-huh. you know. Right. And it was interesting to note that more than 50% of, of it, you will find either a law directly addressing it or a cocktail of laws right, addressing right, right, it. Right. Okay. So legally, a lot of it is supported. Mm-hmm. Perhaps to make the implementation easier, what may have to be done is to then make specific laws. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, for people to flip through pages and go and find one law there and come and uh, join it to another here, it's a bit confusing and and tiresome. And I believe that will be the the next logical step of the adoption of this uh, high-level declaration of Mm -hmm. sustainability principles. Okay. Were you now? Were you involved in the in the Marrakesh uh, uh, getting that agreement done, or were like, I didn't go to Marrakesh, okay. but the final, the I mean, the draft, I I, I was part of it in Ghana. Mm-hmm. The the final one, which then consolidated the the Nash, the, the nine countries, mm-hmm. which was in Ivory Coast, mm-hmm. that I was part of it. So okay. the final draft, we had to go line by line and say, this is it, this is it so that all the countries, we agree with the same commitment. Okay. What were the challenges? Were, I mean, did a lot of things have to change for, for that? Um, not too many had to change. You know, um, the landscape in the oil palm growing areas are 
quite similar, mm -hmm. even though the countries are different. Mm -hmm. It is the land tenure system where you find some differences in the countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But even that, we, we, there, there was a way to craft it in a way that everybody could right. swim in it, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Well, can you talk about the genesis of the APOI, like from your perspective when you saw it emerging? You know, what were the needs that it addressed? What was not working that needed this APOI to come along and kind of get things going? Um, I, as I told you earlier, um, you will find in our laws here and there okay. Okay. clauses that you can trace to, ah, this is to ensure sustainability. Right. But it doesn't say it directly as such, gotcha. okay. you know. So, having minds come together mm -hmm. from government side, from civil society side, right. from private sector, looking at the various facets of sustainability mm -hmm. was certainly a new thing and, and a good thing that could not have happened otherwise. Right, because it, it forced everything just to be put in, in the open, put in a, in a way that everyone has to From look at it. From the different perspectives. The right, right, right. Environmentalists, the social NGOs, and all together around the same table looking at the same issue from their different angles and at the end of the day agreeing that this is the way to go. Are you involved at all in the, the issues in Liberia or are you only focused on Ghana? I bring up Liberia because they're an outlier in all of this, and they, along with Colombia, represent in many ways the first true tests of the RSPO. That's because most plantations that have gotten certified under RSPO did so after they had already been developed, meaning after they had already chopped a lot of the trees in their concessions, under RSPO, companies can't chop trees deemed to have high conservation value, which is a very specific technical concept that we'll explore in later episodes. In both Liberia and Colombia, palm oil is being developed in areas where no concessions have previously existed, as opposed to Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, where the development is mostly taking place on land already given over to agriculture. We pick up with Liberia, and it does get a little technical here, but this technical stuff is what turns ideas into action. We have had regional meetings, mm -hmm. in which case Ghana comes to present our work as it was in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, all the others critique it, we answer, and then if there's something good about some of the suggestions we take on board, mm -hmm. uh, Liberia comes to make their presentation, we critique it. Right. So that, that gave us the benefit of picking from the other countries what one thought was good, mm -hmm. you know, and incorporating in our specific countries. Apart from our, our country level mm -hmm. uh, meetings, we also had regional level meetings and mm -hmm. where all these countries come together. And somehow we managed to learn from each other. Now, you also mentioned you're on the, the National Interpretation Task Force for RSPO. RSPO, yeah. Can you talk about that? What's involved in the National Interpretation Assessments? And okay. Um, the National Interpretation of the RSPO uh, Working Group or Task Force um, has the mandate to look at the generic principles and criteria mm -hmm. from the RSPO and then look at them within the context, the specific context of the country in mm -hmm. which we are. Mm -hmm. The principles themselves, I think 39 of them in all, do not change. Mm -hmm. For instance, transparency is number one. Right. And, and you can't say, oh, in our country it's not done. No, right. you cannot change that. What we start to look at and to change where possible to make it fit the Ghana context are the indicators. Ah, the indicators. A thing that indicates the state or level of something that you can't evaluate directly. How, for example, do you measure transparency or legal compliance? We'll get into that now. There are indicators that must show that indeed 
transparency is working or transparency is not. It is the indicators. And the second one being legal compliance. Um, you cannot say, well, in our country, we, we don't want to be legally compliant. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot change that. Mm -hmm. But what is it that is indicator mm -hmm. that you are legally compliant? Right. For instance, when you take land tenure system mm -hmm. in Ghana and most of West Africa, land is held in the bosom of the traditional chiefs in trust for their people both the living and then those yet unborn, generations unborn. A lot of the land is not documented. Mm -hmm. And the process of getting a land title legally signed, mm -hmm. even for the chiefs, can take mm -hmm. ages. Mm -hmm. So we see there is, however, a way that Ownership is recognized in our Ghanaian context. Mm -hmm. So we will bring that as an indicator that if you can produce A, B, C, D, you can recognize that land as okay. the ownership or the title right, right. can, okay. be, can okay. be recognized. Especially for smallholders. Mm -hmm. For big plantations, they will still have to go through that difficult process. Right. But right. smallholders... We say, look, there's a way that between the chiefs and their subjects, uh, they recognize user rights mm -hmm. and legal rights and title rights and everything. So we then introduce that mm -hmm. as an indicator that when you see, you can take, give it a take. Okay. Gotcha. Otherwise, the generic one will go strictly legal in a certain way. So the national interpretation was to look at all the the, the principles and the criteria and the indicators and try to customize the indicators to what is yeah locally mm -hmm. uh, right, right. yeah and that's the work we do and you know every five years the generic principles themselves will see a revision and we'll have to sit again and see whether there's a case to uh, revise some of the indicators and when right. we do it goes for assessment and comes back sometimes MEMS and finally it's approved and that becomes the national interpretation of the RSPO principles and criteria and okay. that is what auditors or assessors will use to assess us in Ghana. So, so these smallholders they don't own the land they're on a chief's land and they have an agreement with the chief that they can farm this certain territory and then they have rights to the income from from trees on their land if they maintain it is it common to have uh, farmers smallholders who are cocoa and palm or is it does it tend to be one or the other um, a lot of the farmers uh, tend to engage in more than one crop mm. um, if they engage in cocoa or oil palm or both they will still be planting plantain and cassava, which is typical for their um, um, food crops, you know, they, they will still uh, engage in that. Um, you may find one leaning more to cocoa than oil palm or mm -hmm. oil palm than cocoa mm -hmm. or one or the other, but there is not that very distinct uh, mono, uh, so, uh, and what sort of jurisdictional changes have you seen so far, and do you expect to see in the future to promote more sustainable practices across the entire landscape? We actually expect that these processes will be taking another step. The step being that the country should develop a land use plan that reflects sustainability mm -hmm. so that places are demarcated and indeed forest reserves exist and gazetted and by law nobody can enter there but outside the forest reserve we still have a lot of opportunity to either maintain the cover mm -hmm or even grow trees, afforestation. Mm -hmm. Because the forest cover over the last 30 years 
has reduced mm -hmm. by logging and unplanned spatial development. Mm -hmm. And so to have a land use plan that recognizes sustainability and for that matter, conservation of forests, but beyond conservation, the urgent need to begin to re afforest some places back. Samuel Avala wrapping up this edition of Bionic Planet, the last episode before I head to Katowice, Poland for year-end climate talks. If you like what you hear and want to hear more or better shows, you can support me for as little as $1 per month at bionic-planet.com or patreon.com forward slash bionic planet. Once again, that's bionic-planet.com or patreon.com bionic planet and in the patreon one it's bionic planet no dots or dashes i've set the patreon page up so that you can support me per episode but with a monthly cap i'm also open to sponsorship and advertising if the right partner comes along if you're part of an ethical company that wants to reach people who are interested in solutions and isn't directly involved in the issues i cover patagonia and rei i'm talking to you reach out to me and we'll see what we can do. Also, get ready for a barrage of short episodes coming to you from Katowice, Poland, where I'll be covering year-end climate talks there from December 3rd through the 14th. Till then, I'm Steve Zwick, coming to you this week from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Thanks for listening. <laughs>